Francois de Marciac, an intrepid musketeer, is about to embark on the most perilous mission of his young career. A powerful lord is organizing a conspiracy. And once again, Francois puts his life on the line to defend the king's interests. He has already overcome many dangers to get this far. But this time, Francois is personally implicated in this sinister affair. He can't afford to fail. Will he be able to put his sworn enemy out of action? Will he ever see the woman he loves again? The time has come to face his destiny. On this early spring morning in 1657, the sun is timidly warming the old stones of Paris. The streets are bustling with activity. The atmosphere of Paris in the 17th century is extremely agitated. The streets are crowded. Even in the 17th century, people were talking about traffic jams. It's an anthill swarming everywhere. You can hear peddlers haranguing passers-by. There are shopkeepers everywhere. The street is a lively place. As you pass by, you meet people as well as beasts, the horses. And then, from time to time, the animals on their way to the slaughterhouse. Stray dogs? Paris is one of Europe's most densely populated cities. All travelers say they are surprised by the sheer size of the city. A horseman makes his way through the city streets. Judging by his dust-stained outfit and his exhausted body, he's just made a very long journey. To cross France from north to south in the 17th century, you'd need about a fortnight. Today, by car, it will take you a day or so to cover 800 or 900 kilometers. Every journey is an adventure. The roads are often simple dirt roads. From time to time, wolves prowl the roads. And then, of course, there are bad encounters. You can't be sure of reaching the end of the journey. To avoid the chaos, the rider dismounts and leaves his horse with a local woman momentarily to find his way. His name is Francois de Marciac. This little nobleman has just arrived from his native southwest. It's not uncommon to find young nobles coming up to the capital from two generally poor families. Gascony, the southwest, Bern, etc., are populated by noble families, often penniless, not very wealthy. He is one of the so-called cadets of Gascony. He is the second in command of a family. All his family's inheritance goes to his older brother. His one option was to take a gamble and try his fortunes in Paris. Francois de Marciac has only one dream to become the king's musketeer. That young man, in a way he has nothing to lose and everything to gain, and to win he'll have to prove his worth. Francois is full of hope for this new life. First he has to discover the Paris he's heard so much about, and find his way around. 
When you arrive in Paris, you're probably what we'd call dizzy today. The smells, noise and traffic are overwhelming. But not everything is as Francois imagined it. Today I think we drop dead. We talk about pollution, car smells and all that. But I think it must have been absolutely appalling back then. First of all, there were the horses. So already these animal smells. Garbage can bring bones from butcher shops, for example, blood from slaughtered animals. So there's a whole host of activities mixing and mingling their waste. So this is Paris, what a stench. One man quickly realized that this young rider wasn't from around here, and that he was completely lost. The streets of Paris are like a maze, and there's never a name. It's not marked. There are no street signs in those days. There are no numbers. Without someone to guide him, a newcomer quickly feels lost. Francois feels oppressed. How does one find one's way through the crowd? It's easy prey for an experienced thief. And let's not forget that Paris is teeming with thieves. my purse doing in the hands of these beggars? This one-eyed man has just pulled Francois out of a tight spot. He warns him about the dangers of Paris. Francois immediately understands that he'll need help in this immense city. What if this providential man were to become his valet? Of course, he decided to test him on his first mission, to find the address of his uncle who would take him in. Jean Le Borgne passed the test. Francois took him on as a valet. He hopes he's made the right choice. The society of the 17th century is one where social differences are very marked. When you're a nobleman like Francois, there are things you don't do. For example, you don't take care of the daily constraints of material life. And the valet plays this role. He's going to look after him, find him something to eat every day, go shopping and prepare his clothes. Francois has just spent his meager savings at the tailor. Tonight he has a dinner that will be crucial to his career. Dress is extremely important. You have to be fashionable. You have to have the fabrics, the cuts, everything that's being done. If you don't, you're immediately looked down upon, but who knows? That little provincial aristocrat who arrives all crusty, he's despised. I hope that's enough to keep me in line. I won't be so lucky twice. Henri de Loupiac, Francois' uncle, takes care of the final checks. This influential and respected man wants to make sure that his nephew is a match for the powerful people he has invited. 
family's honor is at stake. A young provincial nobleman. After all, throughout his youth, he's played with young men who are more peasant than noble. When a nobleman comes to Paris, he faces a high-level society, a society of a very high level since it's court society. The 17th century was a time when the rules of society were codified. There are even books in which we learn how to behave according to the environment in which you find yourself. The guest of honor is Monsieur de Troismons, head of the Musketeer Company. Francois's uncle has spared no expense in treating him to fine food. Dinner is in the evening, around 12 o'clock. It's more like dinner. Lunch is the first meal of the day, since it's when fasting ends. Lunch replaces our usual morning meal. When attending a dinner party, you need to have time because the menu is very copious. At banquets, dozens of dishes are served from starters to mains from appetizers to soups, entremets, meats, and desserts. Each time there's a profusion of possible choices, we call it French service. Monsieur de Loupiac decided to surprise his guest with some rare vegetables. Vegetables in the 17th century are very fashionable. Why were they so fashionable? Louis XIV loved asparagus, salads, peas, and artichokes. The great lords who went to court discovered this vegetable. They found it delicious. And that's how the fashion spread. Francois is captivated by Monsieur de Troismont. Musketeers are often thought of as imaginary characters straight out of cloak and dagger novels. Alexandre Dumas, Les Trois Mousquetaires comes to mind. But no, the Musketeers actually existed. The King's Musketeers are part of the King's bodyguard. This guard resembles today's Republican Guard, which escorts and protects the President of the Republic. So these Musketeers in the 17th century are considered truly an elite unit. Francois can finally touch his dream with his finger. But how to take the first step? The King's Chief of Musketeers, who bears the title of Captain Lieutenant of the Musketeers and the effective commander of the Musketeers. The real leader of the Musketeers is the King, who is officially their captain, but he delegates effective command of the company to the captain lieutenant. Francois can't believe his eyes or his ears. Monsieur de Troismont brings fresh news from the court. By their proximity to royal power, the musketeers are witnesses to, and even players in, the political life of the 17th century. They are also the musketeers of important figures in Parisian life. At court, Mademoiselle de Quincy is the talk of the town, so beautiful and elegant that she turns the heads of all the courtiers. It's unbelievable. It's like something out of a childhood story. The meal was drawing to a close, but Francois still hadn't had a chance to shine. We also ate a lot of fruit preparations, compotes, for example, candied fruit, fruit in syrup. Anything that could be a form of delicacy like that, little things that were cooked with this sugar, which was extremely expensive, was very much appreciated. But it was also the time when we started drinking tea, coffee, and chocolate. This is the crucial moment. Francois's uncle extols the virtues of his nephew, who would undoubtedly make an excellent musketeer. 
I'm sure he'd make an excellent musketeer. You don't join the company of musketeers by passing an exam or passing a competition. No, you enter by relationship. The chief of the musketeers is the ideal person to enter the musketeers, since he is the one who will choose the young nobles who will join the musketeers. The king would only later validate the musketeers chosen by the captain. Unfortunately, Monsieur de Troismont can do nothing for Francois. But he can give him some valuable advice. Join an academy. He has a very good one to recommend, and it's also one of the most difficult. There are a lot of applicants and very few are chosen. The number of members is fixed. In 1657, for example, there were 150 men. But many young people wanted to join the musketeers, driven by a chivalric ideal of the musketeers' way of fighting. Unfortunately, because of the fixed number of men, most of these young people are unable to join. Dessert has a hard time passing. Will I ever become a musketeer? Francois has started lessons at a Parisian academy. Every day he perfected his fencing skills. For a young nobleman, entering an academy is essential. It's what allows him to complete his training, his training as a future gentleman and soldier. In an academy, which is a kind of military school, he learns the essential disciplines essential for a gentleman, which are fencing, riding, and dancing, that's fundamental. In the 17th century, fencing became a veritable science. Part of the learning process involved mastering a certain number of automatisms, if only. For example, learning to hold a sword isn't as simple as all that. Francois quickly realizes that he's going to have to correct some major shortcomings. He's behind some of his classmates. Everything is important in fencing. The position of all body parts. Of the body, the position of the feet, the position of the trunk, the position of the hands, etc., etc. This is also why fencing masters consider that learning fencing Learning fencing is also a moral apprenticeship because we also learn to keep that the mind remains the master of the body at all times. That's why there are also dance classes. It's not just about crossing swords, it's also about holding a posture. The sword is the nobleman's weapon par excellence. To train with a sword is to maintain one's rank, to defend one's rank. Will Francois be able to live up to the standards of his proud ancestors? To realize his dream? They persevere. Long months pass. Moments of satisfaction, but also of discouragement. I'm tired of repeating the same gestures over and over. When do we take action? To parry a bad blow with a sword. You have to repeat the gesture over and over again. When they leave the academy, they must be able to face a duel to defend themselves in the street. If they're attacked by rogues, they may also be able to go straight to war in a military campaign and fight.
Fortunately, Francois has made a friend who cheers him up. And not just any friend. Pierre de Troimont, son of the chief of the musketeers. A very gifted fencer. He makes a lot of progress. He's also learning new moves that can come in handy in a duel. Pierre knows all the latest war exploits of the Musketeers. Francois is fascinated by his countless accounts of battles. France was continually at war in the 17th century. The reign of Louis XIV, for example, which lasted 72 years, saw only about 20 years of peace during all those wars. The musketeers followed the king to war and took part in most of the battles. Francois again hears about Mademoiselle de Quincy, who has come to dine at Pierre's house with her future husband, Count Derby. Pierre doesn't like this powerful, pedantic, hard man. Francois is sure of it. He too will be part of that world, and soon. A long friendship is born. days later, but Francois is morose. Pierre has suddenly joined the Compagnie des Mousquetaires. Francois will have to continue the academy on his own. Given the close proximity and the intimate gestures, like the valet assisting in dressing, tension is expected to arise. And a real complicity is born, so much so that the valet is often a real confidant. Jean Le Borne introduces him to the best craftsman in the neighborhood and tries to put a smile back on his face. Francois will soon be buying his boots in this store as all the musketeers of Paris come here. For most stores, the presentation of what's for sale isn't at all like it is today through a shop window. It's done with wooden shutters which were opened and closed at the beginning and end of the day, providing a counter on which to place items. Seeing this accumulation, this diversity of all the products that can arrive in Paris and that you can't necessarily find elsewhere, it's a shock, truly. Citrus fruit is not rare in Paris. There are orange merchants, for example on the Pont Neuf, who are regularly authorized to sell and debit oranges. This fruit obviously comes Obviously from Spain, maybe the Maghreb, it's expensive and probably arrives in a very, very relative state of freshness. It's a curiosity for the provincials themselves from large provincial towns who discover it in Paris, usually in the mid 17th century. But can a Parisian have any idea what an orange looks like? Maybe even, what does it taste like? But it's no use. Francois is discouraged and fed up with these stifling alleys. The vast majority of the streets are narrow and quite dark as the buildings are relatively four, five or even six stories high. So you probably feel like you're living at the bottom of a canyon. We still have a lot of very old houses, medieval houses with very difficult to access, very tortuous staircases. And when there's a fire, it's a tragedy because everything catches fire. Francois escapes as soon as he can to his uncle's country residence. The fresh air of his native forests.
I'd love to be in the early morning in the woods of Marciac. The sun reflected on the ponds. Father, mother, I miss you so much. suddenly pierced by ominous noises. A drama is unfolding nearby. The jewels and luxurious clothes of this wealthy damsel would make excellent booty for these brigands. She won't escape them. The highways and byways have gained a notorious reputation for being hotspots of banditry and criminal activity attracting delinquents. This is where you'll find vagabonds and deserters. The roads are unsafe because they are generally unprotected. There are no road police. Today's gendarmerie doesn't exist. Francois wanted action. He's going to get it. Help me! Help me! The two opponents. That's a lot for a first fight. Theoretically, only nobles are allowed to carry a sword at their side. Now that's not to say that only nobles own swords. There's a very strong presence of weapons throughout French society. It was a much more violent society than it is today. Fortunately, Francois soon realizes that he has trained well. The brigands prefer to save their own lives. Francois immediately reassures the young woman. He protects her. She has nothing more to fear. The young woman can't stop thanking him. She tells all her carriage attacked nearby by brigands, then she flees into the forest. And then just when she couldn't believe it, he fell from the sky to save her. But Francois doesn't listen. She's so beautiful. She looks like an angel. Francois introduces himself. He explains that he's going to be a musketeer soon because he works hard to succeed. She introduces herself, Mademoiselle de Quincy. Francois Gasp. So that's who everyone's talking about. Now I understand why men only have eyes for her. But another danger suddenly arrives at full gallop. Francois steps forward to face it. rich, self-confident man. It's Count Darby, Mademoiselle de Quincy's future husband. He explains that he was delayed as he set off to escort her. He was alarmed to discover his carriage robbed on the side of the road. Mademoiselle de Quincy reassures him, all is well. The bandits are on the run, thanks to this brave young man. But the Count ignores Francois. After all, hasn't he done his duty as a gentleman? It's important to understand that in those days, nobles were always in competition with each other, 
and the hierarchy was very strict. A count is of the highest nobility. Francois lacks a title, and though noble means nothing to her. 114 characters. Overcome by emotion, Mademoiselle de Quincy couldn't understand his cold attitude. She'd like to thank you, but the Count takes offense. And by saving Mademoiselle de Quincy, Francois shows his courage and skill with weapons. And by comparison, the Count who arrives too late looks like a coward. Count Darby curtly asks Francois to leave. This young lady is now under his protection. Incredible. He's even more unpleasant than people give him credit for. Time at the Academy. Training resumed with new swords. To learn the art of swordsmanship, a young cadet needs a relatively light sword to practice with. That's not too heavy, with which he can learn the necessary gestures. Then, little by little, we'll give him a slightly heavier weapon. Francois feels he's getting closer to his goal, as this wider, thicker sword is the same as the one used by the musketeers. These are swords that can be carried at one side in daily life, but can also be used in war. But how do you overcome academy fatigue? How do you redouble your efforts to succeed in this new challenge? In war, you need a sword. Especially if he's a cavalryman, he needs to be strong enough, so he needs a heavier sword to learn how to handle. Master the art of managing and utilizing effectively. Since meeting Mademoiselle de Quincy, Francois's mind has been elsewhere. And his master at arms is not at all pleased. To become a musketeer, you have to work harder. Musketeers have the reputation of being swordsmen, i.e. good fencers capable of. They use their weapons effectively in war, but also in town. Fortunately, Francois has a pleasant surprise. Pierre pays him a visit. Francois asks him about his life with the musketeers. His friend replies that he'll soon find out for himself, as he's just been accepted into the company. Francois can't believe his eyes. Now he's going to wear the famous musketeer outfit. In the middle of the 17th century, only a few units wore uniforms, and among those were the musketeers. This cassock is actually a coat worn over civilian clothes. It's royal blue with a white cross ending in fleur-de-lis. The fleur-de-lis symbolized the corps' attachment to royal power. The Compagnie des Mousquetaires was created in 1622 at a time of resurgence in the wars of religion. So there's also this dimension of affirming not only loyalty to the king, but also loyalty to God. The wardrobe of the musketeer is extremely impressive. Francois is so happy that his friend has come to tell him he's joined the Musketeers. And so they continue their adventure together. Francois is slow to realize this. 
Good news never comes alone, however, and he has learned that Mademoiselle de Quincy herself has endorsed his candidacy. He's on cloud nine. Mademoiselle de Quincy is well established in the King's Court, so she certainly has a whole network of influential men and women to whom she can speak highly of young Francois, which will make it to join the company of musketeers. The king may decide to place a musketeer in the company either because he is a great name of the nobility or as a reward for feats of arms, bravery or other achievements on the battlefield. It's now or never for Francois to try and get closer to Mademoiselle de Quincy. Mademoiselle, if you only knew. No, I didn't. But inspiration is hard to come by. I'd love to say no. Francois, hailing from a poor family in the provinces, struggles with speech due to limited education and lack of prestigious education in the best schools in the world. Many men of war prided themselves on not knowing how to write simply because they thought it looked more manly. Francois is more at home with a sword than a pen. But if he persists, the words will come. Mademoiselle, you read the words of the happiest of men. Thanks to you, I'm finally realizing my wildest dream. I've thought of you often since we met. I must admit, I've often wished I could see you again. I would so much have liked to thank you in person. For the young gentleman who couldn't write a letter. There were lots of model letters circulating in Paris. You had a ready-made letter. To write to your beau, depending on the circumstances, to declare your love, or more simply, to ask for a date. In the 17th century, people often took time to write to each other, especially among the nobility. We regularly text all day long, but they could take one H during the day to write their correspondence. Francois calls his valet. He was the one who brought back the letter. So you mustn't imagine that in the 17th century, when you have a letter, you go and drop it in a letterbox and it will be delivered to its addressee the next day. No, that's not how it works at all. Among the valet's duties is that of letter carrier. This is the surest way to ensure that the letter arrives safely and doesn't fall into the hands of just anyone. Francois insists, no one must know of the letter's existence, not even his uncle. His exploits in the forest have caused quite a stir at court. His uncle has urged him to stay away from Mademoiselle de Quincy. The last thing he wanted was to offend the Count again. A valet is basically the master's accomplice. He needs to know just about everything about his... Master, and the master must be able to trust him completely. If the valet betrays his trust, the master must let him go. John is amused. He loves delicate missions. He's not worried. He'll always be there to help his master in case of trouble. On a fine summer's morning, the musketeers escort the king to his residence. Once he's safely through the gates, the musketeers dismount and await the order for the return journey.
There is always a detachment of musketeers who will accompany the king on his journeys. It's not the whole company, just part of it. We take about 50 musketeers who will open the road for the king's carriage and escort him to his destination. For the first time, Francois was part of the royal escort. He's swimming in happiness. That's it. I'm in the great family of musketeers. Father, you'd be so proud of me. Esprit de corps among the musketeers is very important. There's a great deal of solidarity among the musketeers themselves who don't hesitate to help each other. And this is what Dumas had symbolized. Symbolized in his novel, The Three Musketeers by the All for One, for All principle, and which we see in the daily lives. When one of them is in danger, don't hesitate to shout Trois Musketeers and the musketeers would immediately come running. Musketeers in the vicinity who'd come to lend a hand and help their comrades out of a tight spot. Francois had never been inside a royal residence. It almost made his head spin. Being in the service of the king in this elite company, it has to be said, sometimes makes them extremely arrogant, insolent, and even uncontrollable towards the people. The musketeers are both feared and admired by the population, whom they do not hesitate to insult, criticize, look down on, and pursue with sword in hand. Francois is astonished by the looks of the courtesans strolling through the castle's alleys. They look fascinated by the young musketeers. The musketeers had a reputation for seduction. They embodied masculine ideals of manliness and courage. They embodied masculinity and attracted women in certain towns. The bourgeois would supposedly lock their doors, their wives at home, lest they fall under their spell. But Francois is not out of surprises. Mademoiselle de Cancy is there too. And when she recognizes him, she gives him an intense look. Francois' heart leaps into his chest. Could she be sensitive to his presence? Life goes on in the mansion of Monsieur de Loupiac, Francois's uncle. In the basement, the servants prepare the meal. And upstairs, Francois is busy with his new activity, correspondence. Mademoiselle de Quincy answered his first letter, much to his delight. Their exchange continues to intensify. But today, Francois has some serious news for her. Mademoiselle, I'm writing to bid you farewell. I'm leaving tomorrow for the war, ready to give my life for our king. Before going into battle, numerous musketeers, often in their youth, take the time to write their wills, knowing well the grim possibility of death. Francois's uncle came to say goodbye before his departure. His nephew's career since his arrival in Paris has been exemplary, and he congratulates the musketeer on bringing honor to the whole family. but his gaze is caught by a name on a letter. Mademoiselle de Coincy. His enthusiasm is brought to a screeching halt and he goes into a rage. This correspondence is dangerous as the Count is very well informed and surely already knows about all their exchanges. The problem is that since the correspondence is given by the valets, well, the valets talk to each other and the valets talk to their master. 
All lords hired spies to gather information from all sides. What was being said on the left and right to keep up to date, to protect themselves from plots and bad moves. Spies abounded in Paris in the 17th century. Francois doesn't care. The Count doesn't deserve Mademoiselle de Quincy. His uncle orders him to come down to Earth. He's nothing to this woman. And he still hasn't understood how powerful, jealous, and ruthless the Count is. He warns him. This correspondence will be his undoing. It must stop at once, or he will no longer be answerable for his nephew's protection. Francois's letters start again on the road to war. Mademoiselle, what a strange but pleasant feeling it is to write to you from the borders of our kingdom. Mademoiselle de Quincy is enjoying more and more the letters of this exalted young man whose personality contrasts so sharply with the Count's somber character. In the 17th century, women will start to take an interest in other qualities in men, not just manly qualities of courage, although that remains important. But a man who starts to show a certain sensitivity is going to move them more. We've been sieging an enemy fortress for two weeks now. The wait is long, but just writing to you transports me. In the 17th century, warfare was defined primarily by siege warfare, i.e. attacking cities. Towns were increasingly fortified, and siege warfare became a real science. Troops wishing to seize a city belonging to the opposing camp will encircle it, depriving it of any outside help. Covered trenches are built to get as close as possible to the wall, which is then blown up at the last moment. In the end, the square will fall. The essential question is how long it will take. Fortunately, I forged strong friendships with my comrades in arms and were chasing the torments of war in good spirits. What's a soldier's main activity? It's not wielding his weapon, it's playing dice, it's keeping busy. It can be smoky. And we also drink wine and beer. And that's another reason why soldiers have a bad reputation in society. Because in a way, they're seen as people who spend their days doing nothing. Our muskets are ready, and I'm looking forward to my first assault with God's help. I hope to be up to the task. The term musketeer comes from the firearm, i.e. the musket, or the soldier who carries the musket. These are the ordinary soldiers found in all infantry regiments. There are tens of thousands of them, those generally known as Musketeers, i.e. D'Artagnan and our own Francois. This is a certain category of musketeers. They're the king's musketeers, the king's musketeer. He's versatile, fighting all types of wars. Wars, siege wars, battle wars. He shoots with his musket, but he also fights with his sword. The attack is imminent. I'll never see your face again. If this is to be my last letter, I shall die with the satisfaction of having known the most beautiful and seductive woman I have ever known. Mademoiselle, 
De Quincey is unsettled by the tone of Francois's letter. For the first time, her feelings are out in the open. She'll put an end to her illusions as soon as she returns. She has promised to the Count and the situation is too compromising. Our soldiers have managed to place a charge of gunpowder under the wall and blow up the citadel wall. We immediately unloaded our muskets on the enemies defending the breach. Muskets are very heavy rifles and very sensitive to climate and weather. For example, if it's raining, you can't use a musket. It's an extremely inaccurate firearm, so if you shoot it alone, it's useless. And most of the time, we'll shoot in salvo. Several musketeers are lined up. A salvo of fire in the hope of hitting at least a few enemies. Despite her embarrassment, Mademoiselle de Quincy couldn't resist resuming her reading. Will Francois come out of this situation safe and sound? You would have been proud of the daring and magnificent courage with which we then charged the enemy. Once the wall is open, well, you send in the troops, especially the musketeers who usually spearhead the attack. As soon as the King of France's opponents see the musketeers arrive, they get scared because they know that the musketeers are not children at heart. They are truly seasoned soldiers ready to die for the king. This is their duty. I was in a state. I killed men for the first time. I won't go into the horror of the assault. The musketeers really are known as ruthless fighters. The aim is to kill before being killed. It's a moment filled with immense intensity and a surge of violence. If an enemy surrenders, we have the right to execute him. Our victory is total. It pains me to have lost faithful companions. The Compagnie des Mousquetaires particularly in the years when D'Artagnan was their leader, suffered considerable losses. In fact, D'Artagnan died in 1673 at the siege of Maastricht. This first battle left a lasting impression on Francois. You have to imagine it. Does it mean corpses everywhere, wounded, screaming in pain? What is a musketeer? It's someone who can overcome all that. Francois is no longer a child. He's a king's musketeer. To celebrate his military success, the king had a religious ceremony performed. before gathering all the participants in his royal residence for a luxurious reception. There are military personnel in their finest attire for the occasion, as well as the usual courtiers. Everyone wants to look their best. Louis XIV's aim was to enslave his nobility on the one hand, by sending them to fight on the battlefields, and on the other, by keeping them at court, where everyone must be present. 
and appear if they want to be promoted in their careers. It's a way of domesticating the courtiers who live there to serve the king, to observe his greatness and to celebrate him at all times. Mademoiselle de Quincy is here too. Her relationship with the Count is weighing on her more and more, but she puts on a brave face for the courtiers. The world of courtiers is not a pleasant one. Everyone is watching everyone else. You're under constant scrutiny. And then, when you're a stranger, when you arrive at court for the first time, it's all the rage. All eyes are on you. Francois has also been invited in recognition of his military exploits. But he's a little lost in this grand residence. His meeting with Mademoiselle de Quincy comes at just the right moment. In fact, it's exactly what he'd been dreaming of all along. And so has she. She thanked him for his letters, which had amazed and touched her. She finds him in great shape, despite all the misfortunes of war. Francois tells her not to trust appearances. His heart could explode at any moment, just to see her again. The Count, who was looking for Mademoiselle de Quincy, discovers her in the company of Francois, playing a game of seduction. His blood ran cold. He abruptly interrupts their exchange and authoritatively asks his future wife to follow him without delay. There was no marriage, no love in those days, especially not among the aristocracy. All marriages were based on real strategies. The idea was to ally oneself with a large family in order to pool land and keep one's name. An arranged marriage is one in which, above all, both parties and both families have an interest, an interest in title, nobility, for example, i.e. to obtain a title such as Duke or Marquis, which are the highest nobility titles, or an advantage in terms of financial interest. The whole society is based on the principle of arranged marriage from peasants to nobles. Everyone follows the same logic. Mademoiselle de Coincy replies that she first finishes the conversation with Francois de Marciac, whom he no doubt remembers. In the 17th century, legally women have no real rights. She's an eternal minor. That doesn't stop her from having her character and speaking her mind, which may or may not be listened to by those around her. So it's perfectly legitimate for Mademoiselle de Quincy to say she disagrees with Count Derby. My conversation is over. The Count doesn't even look at Francois. He hasn't come to talk to a man of the woods, but to his future wife. Francois is no longer a shy young academician. Why should he let himself be insulted when he saved his future wife from certain death? The Comte feels his anger rising and would have done the same in his place. Mademoiselle de Quincy asks the Count to be more respectful. After all, he was late that day and Francois was there. For the Count, it's a double affront to be both hurt and to feel that his honor has been damaged. Not only by this young man, but also by the fact that his betrothed was defending him. This is too much for the Count. No one has ever questioned his bravery in this way. Since his honor is under attack, he'll defend it in a duel. The nobles who fight duels always refer to a fundamental sentiment, honor. Honor is a... It's a value that's supposed to be above all others. It's better to cleanse one's honor, even if it means dying, than to live with a tainted honor. Francois is quick to accept the duel. He'll be delighted to cross swords. 
with this man he detests and who doesn't even impress him. Mademoiselle de Quincy is much more worried. It is said that the Count has already killed several people in a duel. What if Francois has just signed his death warrant? At the foot of the ramparts of Paris, the atmosphere is peaceful, but a drama is about to unfold. Dueling is forbidden by the royal authorities and is severely punished. The mere act of fighting a duel can result in a death sentence. That's why the best time to fight clandestinely is in the early hours of the morning, when there aren't too many people on the street. The duelists are there, ready to face death. But when nobles close to the king, let alone the musketeers of his guard, engage in duels, he can turn a blind eye. The musketeers fight duels all the time. Athos, for example, the real one, not Alexandre Dumas, died relatively young in a duel. To ensure a fair fight, each duelist is accompanied by a witness. But something's not right. Francois is livid. Could it be fear? Francois has been ill for two days. Pierre tries to dissuade him from fighting. Now he's sure to die. But Francois doesn't want to be seen as a coward. The Derby Count is showing his impatience. Francois moves towards the Count and his destiny. And we're not here to argue or make grand gestures like in cloak and dagger movies. The literary vision of the duel tends to idealize it, to make it a fight between civilized men who want to show everything they've got. Between civilized men who simply wanted to show their courage. But in the 17th century, the duel is a confrontation whose prospect, I would say most likely, is death. Francois knows that the slightest misstep on his part will be immediately fatal. So the two adversaries observe each other. Francois has to find a loophole without revealing himself. He hates fairy tales, but they're well guarded. Francois soon realizes that he's up against a very serious opponent. A powerful attack knocks him back, but he resists. His strength is increased tenfold by adrenaline and the memory of Mademoiselle de Quincy. That's all you're capable of. If I weren't sick, I'd have eaten you alive by now. The Count had noticed that Francois was weakened. He took advantage of the situation to launch a second assault. With violence, Francois gasped for breath. He suddenly feels his energy drain and a sense of unease invade him. No, not that. I've got to hold on. The outcome of the fight is no longer in any doubt for Francois. The end is nigh. The pain pierces him.
When one of the two combatants in a duel is in a state where he can no longer continue, his opponent can simply finish him off. The count gloats. Another duel won. On the other hand, if the wounded man wants to live, he can ask his opponent for mercy. Francois doesn't want to lose face. If I hadn't been ill, you'd be the one on your knees right now. If I ask for mercy from the other man and put my life in his hands, does that mean I accept that he can do what he wants with my life? What he wants with my life? And so I even accept the hypothesis that he might kill me. But Francois prefers to ask the Count's forgiveness for having offended him. If you're a man of honor, you can let him live. Fortunately, this is often the case. The Count finally grants Francois his pardon, with contempt, but he sets a condition. Francois must never approach Mademoiselle de Quincy again. Francois agrees. In fact, what counts in a duel is not so much winning or losing. For a young gentleman, the mere fact of fighting a duel is proof of his courage and that the cause he is fighting for is worthwhile, for which he fights is worth defending. Don't be too sure of yourself. You've won this time. But I'll find you again one day. Mademoiselle de Quincy is growing sadder and sadder. She hasn't seen Francois for six months now. She's had only rare worrying news that his health is deteriorating after his injury. Is he better now? She misses this daring musketeer, especially as the Count is abhorrent to her. He's constantly made him pay for his attitude at the royal reception. And he's increasingly involved in dark affairs of power. Mademoiselle de Quincy's days pass aimlessly. And she shies away whenever she can. When she discovers the tale in the labyrinth, she's taken aback. Could he have something to hide? Snatches of the conversation reach Mademoiselle de Quincy. The Count is surprisingly stressed. Mademoiselle de Quincy has just learned a terrible secret. The last thing she wants is to be found out. Her life would be in danger. Mademoiselle de Quincy asked Francois to come urgently. Defying all prohibitions, he managed to break into her room in her father's mansion. In the 17th century, if young girls weren't in a convent, and if they weren't married, they lived with their parents. Reality often surpassed fiction, as we have the example of a musketeer, who often climbed over the wall of a convent to find an abbess who was... who was also his mistress. What does she have to say to me to make me take such a risk? Why is she so upset? Could it be her feelings? Mademoiselle de Quincy tells Francois that she has caught the Count plotting against the King's Prime Minister. 
There were plots all through the 17th century, plots that targeted those close to the king and plots in which those close to the king, close to the king were themselves involved. Francois is shocked. These are very serious accusations. He asks her what proof she has of this plot. The aim of most plots is to get rid of the current Prime Minister and replace him with a more devoted one. Mademoiselle de Quincy explains that the details of the plot are in a fold in the Count's possession. Francois is distraught. He's flattered, of course, that Mademoiselle de Quincy would call on him, but he's also surprised that she wouldn't. Someone more influential. What if she's playing a game? It's really a difficult situation. You never know if you're going to confide in someone. What are the relationships this person to one of the plotters? If she turns to him, it's because he's the only one she trusts, because of the feelings he shares. For Mademoiselle de Quincy, calling on Francois, the king's musketeer, to denounce a plot is only natural. The King's Musketeer is part. The King's Musketeer is part of the King's bodyguard and therefore a person of trust who surrounds the King. These Musketeers are, in a way, the King's armed wing. Francois is overwhelmed. He promises Mademoiselle de Cancy to do the impossible, but he must act quickly. Mademoiselle de Quincy is left to rely on God, religion in the Kingdom of France. In the 17th century, has a very important place here. We're dealing with people who are very religious, sometimes even superstitious. The king himself is God's representative on earth. He is king by divine right. So it's very much part of people's daily lives. In the early hours of the morning, when company chief Monsieur de Troismont is already hard at work, Francois knocks on his office door. He asks to speak to him alone about a matter of the utmost importance. Monsieur de Troismont is the only one who can help him. But will he believe him? Francois explains that he has received highly confidential information directly from Mademoiselle de Quincy. Monsieur de Troismont immediately cuts him off. He was absolutely forbidden to see this lady again. His attitude was irresponsible and risked causing a huge scandal. Francois has gone much too far. His behavior makes a mockery of his authority and tarnishes the honor of the entire company. His reaction is the logical one for a leader of the musketeers. Because a musketeer must adhere to rigorous discipline. And the chief musketeer is the cornerstone of that discipline. The king relies on him to enforce discipline within the corps. Under the reign of Louis XIV, a number of measures gradually codified the army and the troops of the royal household. Monsieur de Troismont sanctioned Francois. He placed him under house arrest in a room of his hotel particulier until the matter was settled. Any breach of order, failure to comply with daily drills, training, etc., is generally punished by a stay in prison, for example. It was then that Francois insisted on revealing his information. Monsieur de Troismont explodes. He has ordered him to leave this room. Francois is furious. He's going to be imprisoned here for days on end, even as the Count works against the King. 
What can he do? I wanted to prove my worth as a musketeer. I failed completely. What will happen to the king's prime minister? What will Mademoiselle de Quincy will think of me? And what will become of my career as a musketeer? Francois is going through the darkest hours of his life. Unless... But yes... There may yet be a chance. Francois sends for Le Borgne. His valet has a heavy responsibility on his shoulders. On him depends the fate of the Prime Minister, the King, and his master. Le Borgne is waiting for the Count, who has just left a discreet meeting. The Count would like to give the beggar a thrashing. But he prefers not to draw too much attention to himself, a few days away from the plot. Pickpocketing holds no secrets for this one-eyed man. He's just stolen a vitally important letter. Musketeers are on edge. Something serious is going on. Francois is urgently summoned to Monsieur de Troismont's office. of the company has in his hands the fold stolen by the one-eyed man. It's damning evidence that Count Darby is plotting something. The king has just ordered the musketeers to arrest the traitors. Francois must prepare to leave. He takes part in the operation. But Monsieur de Troismont has something to add. The king was very appreciative of Francois's role in the affair. He'll remember that. Musketeers have been assembled for this perilous mission. They have to be quick, because the Darby account is about to go into action. The musketeers are discreetly sealing off the building where the plotters are gathered. No one must escape. The king has his musketeers take all the action he needs. This may involve police action or assassination. The musketeers are both glorious military men and the executors of dirty deeds. The king often uses his musketeers to arrest his political opponents. On the inside, the Count makes final preparations with his main accomplices.
Such was the case with Nicolas Fouquet, the powerful minister of finance who was arrested by D'Artagnan, the real D'Artagnan by Alexandre Dumas D'Artagnan in 1661. It's payback time, Monsieur le Comte. The surprise is complete. Monsieur de Troismont orders the arrest of the plotters in the name of the king. The king can order someone to be locked up without going to court. All he has to do is write a letter de cachet. De cachet, and with this letter, he can have someone locked up in the Bastille. But the three men refuse to surrender. Confrontation is inevitable. as skilled as ever with a sword. He takes advantage of the confusion to flee. Accomplices fight like hell to save their lives. The plotters have nothing left to lose. If caught alive, they will be tried and sentenced to death. But the battle is unequal. Francois is struggling to catch up with the Count, who knows the intricacies of this immense castle inside out. Will he be able to stop him? For their part, the musketeers relentlessly enforced royal authority. By the end of 1650, Louis XIV was in a transitional phase, gradually asserting his royal power and making it absolute. This royal absolutism prevented any uprisings from the nobility is desperate but he doesn't abdicate be no mercy. This fight will be the last for one of the two adversaries. You're a traitor, and you don't deserve this woman. This time, Francois is sure of his strength. 
He even provokes the Count by letting his guard down. Isn't he going too far? Now you'll have to explain yourself to the king, my dear Count. The plot is a distant memory. The last few years have been glorious for Francois. He's now in the king's favor won over by the audacity of this intrepid Gascon. And to his great delight, Mademoiselle de Quincy is now called Madame de Marciac. She now has just one dream left to fulfill, to be a descendant of the prestigious de Marciac family. <laughs> 